The greatest fear of all politicians is to go down in history in a very bad way. That's why politicians never want their political career to end in this way. They aim to influence history for a long time to come. But this does not always work. An allegation that is being discussed among politicians in Europe today is of great importance for the outcome of the war. They say that Lukashenko's political career is about to end. Putin no longer wants to cooperate with Lukashenko. This claim may lead to a change in the political balance all over the world. Anchor Daily News team conducted a research on this claim. This research shows that the crisis in Belarus is very likely to affect the whole world. To talk about all this, let us first briefly recall the situation in Belarus. As you know, Belarus was founded in 1991 after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. In this process, it did not break its ties with the Russian Federation, which was established as a continuation of the Soviet Union. Relations between the two countries continued. In 1994, the first elections were held in Belarus, and Lukashenko became the country's first president. This election, won by Lukashenko, was recognized all over the world. However, after taking office, Lukashenko started to implement repressive policies. None of the results of the elections held after this election can be trusted. Lukashenko is interfering in the elections. Lukashenko uses state power to propagandize against his opponents. He uses state channels to accuse his political opponents of treason. This is destroying the legitimacy of the elections. In doing so, Lukashenko needed support. This support was provided by Putin. In the 1999 elections, Vladimir Putin, who became the leader of Russia, established strong relations with Lukashenko from the moment he took office. In this way, Putin aimed to exert influence over Belarus. In a short period of time, he succeeded in achieving this goal. The Lukashenko administration in Belarus has faced many problems. Putin has always supported Lukashenko in solving these problems. However, this relationship has recently entered a crisis. Putin feels he is not getting enough support from Belarus in his invasion of Ukraine. Belarusian President Lukashenko is very reluctant to support this war. This attitude of Lukashenko has caused problems between the two countries. Since the beginning of the war, Russia has fired hundreds of missiles at Ukraine from Belarusian territory. But this was not enough for Putin. Putin did everything in his power to get Belarus to join this war. Despite Russia's demands, Belarus insisted on not going to war. This caused tensions between Lukashenko and Putin. The two leaders broke the cooperation they had maintained for nearly 25 years. European leaders started to talk about a very important claim. Allegedly, Russian President Vladimir Putin now wants the Belarusian president to change. For this, he has made very important moves. These moves have worried Lukashenko. According to the agreements between Russia and Belarus, if Belarus is attacked, Russia will defend the country. But Lukashenko is very worried about this agreement during his visit to Russia. Lukashenko held several meetings on this issue. First of all, he had a meeting with Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. Lukashenko asked Sergei Shoigu what Russia could do for the defense of Belarus. However, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu gave very hesitant answers to these questions. After this meeting, Lukashenko also had a meeting with Putin, but this meeting did not go well for him. Lukashenko began to feel helpless. The election period is approaching in Belarus. Lukashenko is completely helpless this time because there was a great chaos in Belarus after the elections held in 2020. Lukashenko claimed to have won the elections with over 80% of the vote. But this was not the reality. The Belarusian people did not accept these election results and started a huge revolt. However, Lukashenko exerted great pressure to suppress these rebellions. Putin supported Lukashenko in this process. Lukashenko started arresting protesters after the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic spread around the world. Protesters in Belarus returned home, but this time, the Belarusian people say they will never allow the elections to be manipulated. Lukashenko needs Russia's support to stay in power because Western countries call Lukashenko Europe's last dictator. That's why they do not have good relations with Belarus. This hurts the Belarusian economy. But Lukashenko was preventing his country from going bankrupt thanks to Putin's economic support. But Putin no longer wants to send economic support to Lukashenko. There is nothing Lukashenko can do in this situation. Belarusians are already debating who should replace Lukashenko.
The Belarusian people want liberal policies in line with the West. For this, Belarus's international relations will have to change completely. This will also reflect badly on Putin. European leaders are already discussing who will replace Lukashenko. This debate is very important for the future of world politics, because Belarus is located between Europe and Russia and has a very important geographical position. European leaders want Belarus to pursue a policy in line with Europe. But Putin has different plans, as you know. Putin wanted the Belarusian army to go to war against Ukraine. But Lukashenko, fearing the reaction of the Belarusian people, did not allow it. The Russian army continues to suffer a very heavy defeat in Ukraine. According to Putin, Russia must attack through Belarus to capture Kiev. The southern border of Belarus is very close to Kiev. This may make Putin's job easier, but the Belarusian people do not want to be part of this war. Belarusians are furious about Putin's interruptions. Belarusians hate Putin. That's why they attach great importance to the new administration's independent policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Putin fails to convince the Belarusian people. Putin is facing a huge public backlash in Russia, too. Putin's repressive policies are no longer accepted by the people. Putin is trying to fight both the Ukrainian army and the protesters, but he is failing in both. The growing protests in Russia are also being followed in Belarus. Belarusians are doing their best to get rid of Putin's repression. The elections in Belarus will be a turning point. The Belarusian people, European politicians and Kremlin leaders all agree on one thing. Lukashenko's political career is over. The leader of Belarus must change. If as a result of this change, the Belarusian government established a good relation with the West, this could completely change the course of the war. Russia is now using Belarusian military bases and airports. If Russia cannot use them, it will never win the war in Ukraine. Belarus government crisis has become one of the most critical issues of the war. Perhaps the most crucial development of the Ukrainian war are taking place on the Barmut front. In recent months, Ukrainian and Russian armies have been fighting for this small mining town. While the conflicts in the small city would generally precede it, the war increased its importance day by day. There is a different development every day in Bahmut. Although Russia began the war very ambitious, it could not make any serious gains for almost a year. This increased the losses of both infantry and soldiers of the Russian army and shook the trust of the Russian people in the army. On the other hand, the Russian army, which was a feared figure before the Ukrainian war, has become indistinguishable from any army that is no longer taken very seriously after its last year of performance. Russian President Vladimir Putin plunged his country into war despite its limited resources. The already deteriorating Russian economy has officially collapsed with war spending and global economic sanctions. Putin must deliver a significant war win to his people so that this collapse is forgotten, at least for a short time. This makes the Battle of Barmud a little more important. Once the Russian army takes control of Barmud, it will continue to advance into Ukraine. Ukraine continues to defend Barmut so that exactly this scenario does not happen, and so far it has managed to keep the Russians here. Another importance of Barmut is that if the Ukrainian army can drive the Russians out of here, it will open a corridor for itself where it can take the Donbass region back under its control, just as they struggled to liberate Crimea after taking control of Kherson on the southern front. So what's the latest situation in Barmut? Prior to Ukraine's counterattack aimed at recapturing Russian-controlled territory, Russian forces fought to cross the narrow river that bisects the eastern Ukrainian city of Bahmut. Ukrainian forces moved out of their positions on the east bank of the river, which stretched from north to south and formed the front line between the Wagner Group. Paramilitary fighters now leading the Russian offensive in Bahmut and the Ukrainian soldiers defending the city. Wagner's founder, Yevgeny Prigazin, said Russian troops were positioned about three miles from downtown Bahmut. For Bahmut, the months-long war becomes even more important as he assigns new troops to the defense of Ukraine and promises to hold him. Despite Russian advances to the north and south that threaten Ukraine's supply lines entering the city, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met with senior military officials in Bahmut to discuss Ukraine's options. Some Western analysts have questioned why Ukraine has not withdrawn from a city of little strategic importance and where it is at risk of being cut off. Ukraine says it is trying to bring down Russian forces, which it says have suffered even greater losses.
The area around the river in the center of the city became a killing zone as Ukrainian troops targeted Russian forces trying to cross from the east in fortified buildings. Ukraine has destroyed important bridges over the river, but any attempt to hold its positions there is jeopardized by Russian attempts to besiege the city. The Ukrainian armed forces repelled more than 100 Russian attacks in the past 24 hours, and subsequently, Russia bombed 19 settlements around Bahamut. Russian military bloggers, often reflecting the views of the Kremlin, reported that Wagner troops launched an offensive to take the village of Kremov on the western bank of Bahamut, allowing control of this village to cut off the Ukrainian forces and avoid a possible retreat for Ukraine. Located on a hill overlooking Barmut from the west, he said he would let him plan an attack in the south of Ukraine. Newly mobilized Russian troops arrived in the Russian-controlled areas of the Zaporizhia region from where they will cross into Barmut to join existing Russian troops ahead of an offensive that Ukrainian forces are suggesting will begin in the coming weeks. Russia continued to launch artillery strikes on Kherson in the south, which was retaken by Ukraine in November. In parallel with its offensive on Barmut in eastern Ukraine's Donbass region, which Moscow was trying to seize, three civilians lost their lives and five were injured after Russia fired 335 rounds at different targets in the region since the re-entry of Ukrainian troops in November. The city of Kherson has been regularly bombed by Russian troops stationed along the Dnipro River. So what awaits us in the coming days? Exhausted by the winter battle that resulted in heavy casualties but little significant change in the front line, Ukraine and Russia are preparing for the spring offensive, which both sides hope will turn the tide of the war as the muddy ground dries up a paved roads and fields first in the south of Ukraine and then in the east will become traversable again in the coming weeks, allowing armies of both countries to make breakthroughs with mobile mechanized units coming out of the months-long defense of the eastern city of Bahamut. The Ukrainian army is training tens of thousands of new recruits, including in camps operated abroad by the U.S. and European allies, for three new corps expected to join the spring advances. Kiev is also receiving a massive influx of Western-made heavy weapons, including Leopard, two tanks, Bradley and Stryker combat vehicles and Paladin and Archer self-propelled howitzers, and is renewing the equipment it has consumed over the past year. However, for the first time, Ukraine will deploy such Western-made advanced tanks and infantry fighting vehicles on the battlefield. Ukrainian officials said that the spring offensive will begin in one and a half to two and a half months. During this time, Ukraine will accumulate resources and remain absolutely silent about where they can attack along the 830-mile active front line. Meanwhile, Russia gathered forces as it sought to break through the Ukrainian defenses in the eastern Donetsk region where Barmud is located. They made slow gains in Donetsk while suffering heavy losses during the winter months. The advances Russia was able to make every 100 to 200 meters in the field burned by artillery came at the cost of covering the ground with the corpses of its soldiers. Ukraine does not have such a manpower resource, and even if it did, no one would agree to use it as cannon fodder. As Russia prepares for a protracted war and President Vladimir Putin bets that the West's willingness to provide military and financial support to Kiev will not last, Ukraine is feeling increasing pressure to show results on the battlefield. This summer is incredibly important for the Ukrainian military. If they don't make progress to the end, voices will grow in the West, either calling for a negotiated solution or arguing that the West should not support Ukraine at all. As Ukrainian leaders seek to expel Russia from all the lands they have taken, they also understand that the success or failure of the impending offensive will determine Kiev's hand in any negotiations that may be imposed by Ukraine's Western partners. To be strong in any conversation, Ukraine must be strong on the battlefield. This is the way to peace. Ukrainian officials view Russia's military defeat as the only guarantee of their country's survival and are wary of the West's promises. Without full membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, something that will not be offered anytime soon. They point out that Ukraine renounced nuclear weapons inherited from the Soviet Union after the US, UK, and Russia provided security assurances in the 1994 Budapest Memorandum that force would not be used against the country's territorial integrity. The Ukrainian and Russian armed forces are entering action this spring, having lost most of their professional soldiers in the past year. According to Western officials, while no country publishes casualty statistics, the total casualties in wounded and dead amount to hundreds of thousands. As a result, the two armies now increasingly rely on soldiers with limited skills. 
Today, the biggest news is coming from the East. Here, Russian commanders of the urban forces, in an attempt to take all the credit for the Barmut operation, recently conducted a massive offensive and gained a lot of ground. However, their achievements were short-lived as Ukrainians quickly adjusted, dragged the Russians through the kill zones, and conducted a successful counterattack, returning everything that they lost. Previously, I told you that Russian conventional forces conducted an intense attack in the northern part of the city, and due to the sheer manpower superiority, forced the Ukrainians to step back from their positions. I also told you that by the end of the day, Ukrainians managed to break the momentum by focusing their artillery fire on this region, which allowed them to start launching limited counterattacks. The freshest reports indicate that over the last two days, Ukrainian forces have been rapidly gaining momentum. The first confirmation of a Ukrainian success came from a Ukrainian fighter from the Adar Battalion. He stated that Ukrainians recaptured at least half of the high-rise buildings on the outer edge. Later, footage of the explosion was published showing how the Municipal Department of Culture was reduced to rubble. The explosion was controlled and conducted by Ukrainian forces, which clearly suggests that Ukrainians returned control over the second half of the high-rise buildings. Later, this information was confirmed by Russian forces that showed that Russians were trying to cross the alley. This means that today Ukrainians achieved two crucial objectives. Firstly, by destroying the building in the middle of the wide and open alley, Ukrainians significantly complicated Russian assaults because this building was the only thing that provided them cover. Secondly, Ukrainians secured control over the outer edge of the city which allows destroying all Russian assault units that tried to approach Kromova and cut off one of the main supply routes to Bahmut. Russians also partially retreated from the residential area with small houses. Today's combat footage showed how Russians are either retreating or abandoning their positions. This group was spotted near the rails, and not all of them survived, which clearly indicates Ukrainian presence. After seeing that almost all gains generated by their extremely costly offensive effort had disappeared, Russians resorted to intense shelling. Ukrainian fighters reported that shelling was indeed very intense. Although Russians were late as the most important strong points were already recaptured, as the Russians noticed that the situation did not change in their favor, they started using massive guided air bombs. A Ukrainian fighter from the Adar Battalion reported that in the aftermath of artillery and aviation strikes, the residential area with small houses had been almost completely wiped out. So from now on, neither Ukrainians nor Russians cannot maintain a permanent presence in this region. Russians also changed their tactic, and right now they are assaulting Ukrainian positions in the following way. Firstly, they focused their artillery fire on a very narrow section of the front and then sent a human wave to try and capture a quarter. If it doesn't work, then they repeat the procedure. So far, it doesn't work. And in the evening, one of the fighters said that today Russians lost here at least 200 men. Heavy use of artillery and human waves consisting of large assault units is exactly how regular Russian forces work in other directions, which once again indicates that commanders of urban forces took over the operation in Bahamut. When it comes to the central part of the region, the situation here stabilized compared to other days. Russians are still struggling to breach Ukrainian defense on the train station and also on Kismonavtiki Street. In the southern part of the region, Ukrainian drone operators continue survival in the area non-stop. Recent footage published by the fighters of the Ukrainian 93rd Mechanized Brigade showed how they detected a Russian assault unit that tried to advance in between houses and destroyed it with artillery fire. Overall, the recent Russian offensive effort to collapse the Ukrainian defense in Barmut failed. It looks like the commanders of the urban forces tried to simultaneously take over the operation, surprise Ukrainians with new tactics, and get the credit for ending the battle for Bahamut. Unfortunately for Russians, Ukrainians quickly understood that Russian forces were overly concentrated and started retreating whenever necessary while Ukrainian artillery was eliminating hundreds of attackers. As a result, Russians ran out of men to sustain the same intensity of attacks. Their attack imploded, and Ukrainians gradually took back almost all territories from which they temporarily retreated.